Good evening. Good evening and welcome to St. Mary's College. My name is Arlene Montevecchio and I'm the director of the Center for Spirituality here at the college. 2019 marks the 35th anniversary of the Center for Spirituality. Founded in 1984 with generous support from the Sisters of the Holy Cross, the Center seeks to advance the study of spirituality, the integration of faith and reason, and attention to Catholic women's experience. 2019 also marks 175 years of the College of the Sisters of the Holy Cross, empowering women to make a difference. Many of our sisters are here tonight. Please let us show them our gratitude. <laughs> Following tonight's lecture and Q&A time, there will be some refreshments, so I encourage you to stay. Please also take information on our upcoming events on April 25th at 7.30 p.m. in Carroll Auditorium, Nancy Pineda Madrid will be our 34th annual Mataliva Lecture. This summer, we will have two opportunities, a summer seminar featuring Sister Simone Campbell and Embody, a high school youth theology institute for girls going into their sophomore, junior, and senior years. Tonight, I have the distinct privilege of introducing our third distinguished lecturer for our Spring Endowed series, Theologies of Lived Faith. Sandra Yoakum received her PhD from Marquette University and currently serves at the as the University Professor of Faith and Culture at the University of Dayton and continues to teach in the Religious Studies Department. She also had four glorious years of teaching at St. Mary's College. Among her publications are Joining the Revolution in Theology, the College Theology Society, 1954 to 2004, and an edited volume, Clergy Sexual Abuse, Social Science Perspectives. Her essays have appeared as edited volumes, such as The Theological and Ecological Vision of Laudato Si, as well as in journals like Theological Studies, U.S. Catholic, Historian, and Horizons. Her long labor of love is to write a history of women's entrance into the formal study of theology, featuring St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra Yoko. Thank you, Arlene, and thanks to all of you who are here tonight. I, I understand uh, there's a basketball game going on somewhere nearby, so I really appreciate your being here. I want to uh, express my gratitude to Arlene for inviting me and for you all to be here. And I especially want to express my gratitude to, to the Sisters of the Holy Cross, uh, Dr. Egan, who was my teacher at Marquette, and to all of my colleagues and friends who are here this evening. For the students who are here, just so you know, this talk will last about 50 minutes. I always think that's important to know. So. And just a word about the slides. They don't perfectly match up, but it gives you some images to look at. Some photos are missing because I can't find these images. So they get frames with an empty space, all right? So the title for this evening talk is, of course, a nod to Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. Asked to speak on the topic of women and fiction, she delivered two lectures in October of 1928 at Newham and Girton Colleges where women could receive college degrees under the auspices of Cambridge University. A far longer essay organized into six parts appeared in print the following year, 1929. Perhaps most familiar from this essay and the title's inspiration is her insistence that, quote, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction, end quote. A point she introduces in the essay's first paragraph and reiterates in various ways throughout her essay, including its conclusion. I want to note that Woofs published this essay less than 100 years ago. Now, I understand that many are persuaded by our contemporary culture's insistence on our rapid rate of change, ever increasing opportunities, including greater freedoms for women. Yet the deep cultural changes for which Virginia Woolf yearned changes concerning women's agency and their full participation and creative engagement in their worlds 
remains in too many cases unrealized and in some cases prove as controversial today as they were in 1928. Yet I have no doubt about Wolf's insight that women with a creative urge and the talents to match only need a wee bit of space, a modicum of time, and life's basic necessities to pursue their desires. About 14 years after Ms. Wolf lamented the shortage of rooms and funds for women to write fiction, another woman with the surname Wolf in this case, one O and two Fs, offered women a space and a few basics, not to compose fiction, but to do something even more novel, a fortuitous pun. She offered them a school where women could engage in the formal study of theology. The woman of whom I am speaking is, of course, Sister Madaliva Wolf, CSC, poet, scholar, and from 1934 to 1961, president of St. Mary's College, Notre Dame, Indiana. Listen carefully to her recollection of the origins of such a school. She records in her autobiography, My First 70 Years, that at a 1943 meeting of the National Catholic Education Association, the NCEA, quote, with that strange impulse outside of my will, end quote, she volunteered this campus as the site for a graduate school of theology for women. In 1943, the impulse was indeed strange, since those who studied theology were the ordained or on their way to ordination. The primary site for this study was a seminary or a school with an ecclesiastical affiliation which granted real theology degrees, papal degrees, the licentiate, the STL, and the Doctorate in Sacred Theology, the STD. Women, at least in the United States, were not permitted to pursue these degrees at these exclusively male institutions. Undergraduate majors in theology or religious studies did not exist, even at Catholic men's colleges and universities, let alone at women's. St. Mary's, like every other Catholic women's college, required undergraduate students to take religion courses but had nothing like an undergraduate degree in religion or theology. The school's most recognized alumna, Mary Daly, confirms this absence in her autobiographical preface to the 1975 edition of The Church and the Second Sex. Quote, I was accumulating doctoral degrees, the first in theology and the second in philosophy at the University of Fribourg, Switzerland. There was no place in the United States where a female was allowed to study for the highest degree in this field, the canonical doctorate in sacred theology, which was true. She makes no mention of her St. Mary's doctorate. Anne Brody, in her book, Sisters and Saints, Women and American Religion, does acknowledge the earlier degree. She explains that Mary, Mary Daly, quote, already had a doctorate in theology from Notre Dame. So from almost every angle, and that is a quote, Madaliva's proposal remains strange, hard to acknowledge as real, even to as accomplished a historian of women as Anne Brody. What I find even more fascinating is Madaliva's identifying this vol voluntary act as an impulse located outside her will. The external source remains unnamed, but surely sounds like the Holy Spirit whose actions, like the Indiana wind today for sure, are at times quite strong and unpredictable, making its invigorating presence known in even the narrowest of openings, like a women's college of around 500 undergraduates in a small Indiana town. So for Madaliva, founding a school of theology was in a very real sense a leap of faith and an act of hope. To make this point certainly does not preclude discussing Madaliva's employing her astute administrative skills and ecclesiastical political savvy to transform the impulse into a reality. By the summer of 1943, Sister Madaliva had a modest non-credit six-week pilot program in place. 18 students took offerings from three instructors. In 1944, she had established St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology where women could receive a master's degree and a doctorate in the study of theology. Though the degrees, the degrees were technically in religion from 1944 to 1956 and later in sacred doctrine, 1956 to 1966. 
She garnered key uh, uh, ecclesial support, not only from the local bishop, John Francis Snow, but also and perhaps most importantly from Matt Oliva's longtime friend, Kansas City, Missouri's bishop, later archbishop, Edwin B. O'Hara, whom she had met in Rome and had accompanied on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in early 1934. Without a doubt, Edwin B. O'Hara proved an invaluable ally in the school's founding. As chair of the National Catholic Welfare Conference's Committee on Confraternity of Christian Doctrine, CCD, he authorized US scholars to produce a new English translation of scripture. He also used his national stature to support Sister Madaliva's endeavor. His apparent confidence in Sister Madaliva's ability fit the pattern that his biographer, Timothy Dolan, yes, that Timothy Dolan, Archbishop Cardinal Dolan, described as his, quote, heavy investment in the competency and skills of strong-willed women, end quote. In the case of Madaliva's school, he paid more than lip service to this commitment. It is more than likely that he helped to secure the services of Father Michael Blumfather, a Jesuit, a respected Catholic biblical scholar, and editor of the Catholic Biblical Quarterly at that time. He had assisted in the CCD scripture translation and then defended it against a charge of heresy. Grunfoner became the school's chancellor. O'Hara also guaranteed a job for any laywoman who graduated from St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology, and more on that a little later. Catholic horizons of hierarchical approval hardly ended with US bishops. O'Hara, along with Grunfoner and Father Edward Heston, general procurator of the Holy Cross Fathers stationed in Rome, successfully secured Pius XII's apostolic blessing. An official letter dated December 12, 1949, communicated the good news and appeared in every school of theology bulletin thereafter. Its author, Cardinal Pizzardo, prefect of the Congregation on Seminaries and Universities, extols the school's founding with rhetorical exuberance. Quote, my admiration grew as I read the bulletin that Madaliva had sent him, and my joy to see such enthusiasm for the science of sciences, the knowledge of God in your young and ardent America. It will, as you say yourself, produce a robust spiritual life and unfailingly bring the light of truth to others, especially to the young, the world of tomorrow, end quote. Curiously, he never explicitly acknowledges that women are studying theology, though he delights in telling Reverend Sister, quote, that in this I only echo the sentiments of his holiness himself, who rejoices in the success of your school of sacred theology, who sends with all his heart his apostolic blessing to the faculty and to all those who are privileged in following these courses, seeking a deeper knowledge of religion amongst Catholics, end quote. St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology may not have been a papal degree-granting institute, but Madaliva, with a little help from her friends, got about as close as a small Midwestern women's college could in 1949. Now, I must admit that Madaliva's claim of St. Mary's as the first to grant advanced degrees in theology met with some protests. Catholic University of America founded the Department of Religious Education in 1931, and according to one of its faculty members, Reverend W.H. Russell, by 1943 had awarded one PhD and 68 masters to sisters. Sister Madaliva might have responded that the curriculum was not real theology, that is, the study of Thomas Aquinas. She could also point to a 1943 article in the Catholic University Bulletin by Eugenie A. Leonard, Dean of Women, Associate Professor of Education, whose sketch of women's attendance at CUA concludes, quote, today all the graduate schools except the School of Sacred Theology and Canon Law are open to women students, end quote. In case you missed it, note that the exclusively male school's name was the School of Sacred Theology. St. Bonaventure offered a summer's master's degree to religious sisters beginning in 1939. In a direct challenge to Madaliva, Reverend Irenaeus Hersher, OFM, in a 1950 article in the Catholic School Journal, credits Father Thomas Plasman, OFM, for establishing a department of, quote, sacred theology for religious brothers, sisters, and lay teachers. That's in 1939. Plasman, St. Bonaventure's president from 1920 to 1946, in an unpublished paper in St. Bonaventure's College Archives, 
recollects the specific occasion for the idea's genesis. At an NCA meeting in Milwaukee, a discussion of how to teach religion in our schools became heated. <coughs> Excuse me. As Father Plasman describes it, quote, a few of the sponsae priestae, that's sisters, cross swords with one or two of the sacerdotes de, dei, that is the priest. At a lull in the debate, quote, a sister who for the moment took on the role of the valiant woman of Proverbs 31 rose to her feet and with courage in her voice and fervor in her heart thus addressed the reverend gentleman of the cloth. Why all this secretness about your theology? Is there anything in it that we sisters should not know? Or are we judged incapable of grasping it? For years and scores of years, we are doomed to ask the same simple catechetical questions over and over again. If we do want to know more about these beautiful truths, we are handed a somewhat more detailed explanation of the catechism, but a book of theology, never. We should like to know more, if for no other reason than our own satisfaction and spiritual comfort. We love our work, but it is tough to be told all the time that for a fuller explanation, we shall have to wait until we enjoy the beatific vision in the realms above." End quote. Plasman responded to the anonymous but valiant woman's challenge with a five summer 40 credit master's program taught conveniently enough by St. Bonaventure Seminary staff. The Franciscan's un unpublished paper makes clear his aspiration for women studying theology. Of course, we theologians do not want, do not want the sisters to learn more than we know ourselves. That would be disastrous. The purpose is not to train theologians or professors of theology or writers of theological treatises, but teachers of religion in order that they may acquire a fair understanding of religion as a science, which is theology." End quote. St. Bonaventure never made doctoral studies available to women. Sister Madaliva had a far grander vision for women studying at St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology. In one of her many public lectures, she spoke to her um, audience of young women about their Catholic foremothers. With her usual dramatic flair, Madaliva declared, Christianity is at crucial war with the devil. Who is going to combat this condition? Who under God is going to preserve Christianity in our country? Her response extolled the intellectual capabilities of women victorious in past skirmishes. She describes a fourth, women's, uh, fourth century women's study club who assisted their confessor, Jerome, in translating the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate, which served the church as the church's official translation into the 20th century. She recalled Catherine of Siena, who demanded the Pope return to Rome from Avignon, and Teresa of Avila, who reformed the contemplative Carmelite order. She then summarizes. Two lay women gave us our Bible, one lay woman saved Rome for the church, one cloistered nun reformed the spiritual life of her time, end quote. And concludes, somewhere among all our magnificent Catholic young womanhood, there must be another Catherine of Siena, another Eustochian from that study club. Perhaps from our school of sacred theology, she may emerge, end quote. Notice also her verb choice, must, not might or may. Madaliva wanted to give valiant women a room a school in which they could discover their magnificence. I hope you have a better appreciation of why I described Madaliva's founding of this school as a leap of faith and an act of hope. Faith and hope surely in God and in the women beloved of God to whom she offered a space for theological education. The valiant woman proved to be a recurring theme in the narrative accounts of women's quest for theological education. In the Catholic School Journal, Mary Fitzgerald asserts that the multiple opportunities in 1947 for women to study theology, quote, can trace their lineage to the first founded and most formally organized of such schools, St. Mary's School of Sacred Theology of Notre Dame, Indiana. She then gives an account of Madaliva's initiative that suggests far more resistance than any found in Madaliva's own public reflections, quote, when Sister Madaliva bravely asserted that she would found a graduate school in which women might study theology, a shocked and dismayed silence was the response. But a new era in Catholic education began. 
Those who now complacently contemplate what Sister Madalita's decision has brought about have no comprehension of what travail she endured. When she began her search for professors, pious eyebrows were raised and learned foreheads drawn. Shall it be whispered that those who should have hurried to her support hesitated, doubting both the rock of her inspiration and the rod of her will? But alone and valiantly, she persisted in her efforts. From the most discouraging beginning and inconceivable opposition in the summer of 1943, St. Mary's School of Sacred Theology has grown surely and securely." End quote. Fitzgerald could not anticipate what the next 20 years would bring. Madaliva retired as president of St. Mary's in 1961 and died in 1964. In the transition to a new presidency at St. Mary's, coupled with the tidal wave, perhaps better called the tsunami of change in Catholic theology, Madaliva's endeavor did not survive. The school officially closed in 1966, and it helped its last few graduates to complete their degrees, the last in 1969. So the question remains, what historical significance does the story of the short-lived experiment at a small, remember, less than 500 students total, Catholic women's college in the Midwest have? Women, especially women religious, who were the majority of the students at this school, rarely made the headlines. In fact, any effort to do so was expressly forbidden. Mary Daly, who made plenty of headlines, gave little, gives little credit to her St. Mary's education. But is the hiddenness of this school's story so different from the other stories of women in American religious history? Anne Brody, who got in trouble a little bit earlier, in the introduction to Sisters and Saints, invokes, quote, an old saying among members of African-American churches, Women are the backbone of the church. She goes on to say, the saying has a double meaning. Women provide essential, essential support and affirm its moral role, but their work happens in the background and their support is invisible, end quote. The women who founded, supported, and attended St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology are part of that backbone. In the academic year of 1998 and 1999, yes, it's probably before some of the students in this room were born. I had a grant from the Louisville Institute to work on this book and specifically to interview graduates of St. Mary's School of Sacred Theology. I have about 28 interviews with alumni. In the time remaining, I want to share a few of their stories. I have organized the material under the following three headings, being sent to study theology, experiences during studies, and alumni at work. So being sent to study theology. Interviews with sisters quickly taught me that the selection for theological studies was rarely a consultative process. Sister Dorothy Johnson, a school sister of St. Francis, taught elementary school in Milwaukee when she was sent to St. Mary's in summers from 1951 to 1956. She observed, quote, in those days, Mother General just sent us. How she picked us, I have no idea. I never thought of asking her how I was picked for that. Sister Frances Teresa, a sister of St. Joseph of Brentwood, who taught high school English, recalled, Mother General sent for me one day and she said, would you like to study theology? And I said, study theology? I am not capable of that. At that time, I was way off. And she said, well, we think we're going to send you. <laughs> sister Frances Teresa was sent to Providence College, whose summer program for sisters began in 1948, FT, as her community called her clearly misjudged her capabilities because Father George Friel, who directed the Providence program, this is her again, came out to Brentwood and asked Reverend Mother if she would send me to study further at St. Mary's. That's how I landed at St. Mary's. So I was catapulted into it, really. The term catapulted is so vivid. It suggests being thrown into a new realm from a force outside herself. Sister Pascalina Koff, a Benedictine of the Perpetual uh, Adoration, went to St. Mary's from 1957 to 1959, and she provides a more humorous explanation of her selection. She said, and I always thought that I was chosen to be a companion to the Summa, which for those that don't know, is a play on a, on a book called Walter Farrell's A Companion to the Summa. Because the sister that I went with had at least had a master's degree in social work from St. Louis University. She had a bachelor's degree in dietetics. Finally, I offer one example of a woman who at the time of her studies at St. Mary's was a laywoman, Mary Barbara Kane, 
When I interviewed her, she was a Sister Mary of God, a member of a Dominican contemplative community. She recalls her senior year at St. Mary's. I had majored in Latin, minored in education, and practiced taught a little, and had probably planned to go on for some kind of classical degree or something and teach maybe, and then Sister Madeleine and I were good friends, although she was older than I, so she called me in one day in my senior year and said, would you like to go to the School of Theology? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I don't think I could explain this to my family. They could see if I wanted to go on and get a master's in Latin and teach someplace. Studying theology would have been a very strange thing to say. Madeleine made no comment. Kane continues. So graduation came, and all of a sudden there was this Sister Madeleine scholarship to the School of Theology for the summer for a laywoman. I was the awardee. It was six weeks. In those six weeks, she discovered, as she exclaimed to me, I just loved theology. Perhaps Madeleine recognized in Cain what was hidden to herself, studying theology. One of the most surprising aspects of my interviews was with the graduates of the school was how vividly graduates recalled their scripture classes rather than the study of Thomas, and how frequently they mentioned its continued impact on them personally and professionally. Three scripture uh, faculty members received mention, William O'Byrne, who was a Dominican, who taught New Testament, Michael Grunfahner, Jesuit, who taught Old Testament, and Carol Stummuller, a passionist who taught Old and New, and New Testament. Father Grunfahner received the most frequent mention. Sister Dorothy recalled that Father Grunfahner insisted that we take all our notes in our Bibles. When it came time for a test, of course, we had to refer to our Bibles, and we said, how can we do that? We have all our notes in there. But his questions were so far out that your notes wouldn't help. We just used to laugh and laugh. He was kind of a humorous person. He made scriptures come alive to us. He really did. He could demonstrate like all get out. She also talked about Father O'Byrne. He taught the New Testament, and he made St. Paul come uh, to life. There was no nonsense about him, but he was a very, very good teacher and just made everything come to, so to life for us, end quote. I am struck by her repetition of their ability to make scripture come alive. Sister Mary Mikna provided still another perspective, especially about Grunfahner. She saw him as way ahead of his day. In fact, <clears throat> In fact, he would say, these are new insights. He wasn't giving us the old stuff. The encyclical had come out from the Pope, Divino Afflante Spiritus. So he was free to go ahead and do all of the studies. So it wasn't the old stuff that we got. It was new, even though it was before Vatican II. In describing Grunfahner, she, like many others, recalled a dear old man. He would talk in such a way that you just wanted to listen. He had so many good insights. I think it was the newness of it, and it was really very invigorating. These fond remembrances actually present a conundrum for me because my contemporaries judge Michael Grunfahner to be quite the opposite. He is known for defending a literal, and I mean literal, reading of Genesis 2 and 3. Others describe Grunfahner as a casualty of the aftermath of the modernist condemnation. He was sent to study at the Pontifical Biblical Institute prior to World War II because he had a degree in geology, right? because of Genesis. These interviews offer another perspective on this professor of Old Testament and the complexities of those transitional times in theological and biblical studies. Sister Pascalina attended St. Mary's after Father Grunfahner had retired. His replacement was Carol Stummuller, a post divino afflante spiritu scripture scholar. Sister Pascalina told me, I went to all Catholic schools before that, and we never had scriptures taught to us. I was just so thrilled with some input on the New Testament. We had Father Carol Stummuller. He was just fresh from studies in Europe, in Rome, and he would just be shaking, and he would shake his paper just to help us laugh with him because he had so much intensity in him. And he would never use notes. He would just open the Bible right to the place that he wanted, and it would just pour out of him. What a vivid description from an experience that happened 40 years earlier. She also brings to light something else. He was an enigma because he was totally open to women's ordination, but he had a fit when we shortened our habits. His mother was so closely devoted to the Sacred Heart, and that meant so much to him. And then he was so modern. He found nothing against ordination in the scriptures. He was totally open to that whole realm. 
So here in just a few phrases are further insights into the complex sensibilities of these transitional generations of biblical scholars. The recollections about studying the Summa are not quite as vivid. Still, some of the interviewees expressed a deep love for Thomas. Sister Frances Teresa recalled Father Grunthaner and O'Byrne very fondly, but what came to her mind was the study of Thomas. Everything was Summa. In fact, my feeling about it was what Thomas said, that must be right. That was the implication. She thought that Thomas would not say the same thing today. The thing I loved about Thomas was he was searching for truth. So no matter where he found it, it could be Hebrew, it could be Muhammad, sorry. It could be anybody. If there were truth there, an inkling of truth, he would bring it together. And I felt that was tremendous. Others reiterated those sentiments about the lasting impact of Thomism as an inspiration to their continued intellectual and spiritual growth. Another student who had a passion for Thomas Aquinas, at least as told by her classmates, was Mary Frances Daly. Unfortunately, she didn't grant me an interview. Her lack of response makes perfect sense to me, given her hard-won identity as a post-Christian feminist philosopher. In her autobiography, Outer Course, she describes, quote, an intuition of being, B-I hyphen I-N-G, and the, she got it from, uh, she said the speaker was a hedge. Now, it's, and that's a quote from our outer course. So it's difficult to ignore the many debates, however, that were going on being at that time among Neotomists. An admiring classmate offers a story that suggests Daly's beginning struggles uh, with Aquinas, whom at that time she totally admired. In the day's summa assignment, treating who might testify in a court of law, Thomas excluded certain groups as witnesses due to a, quote, defect in reason, as in the case of children, imbeciles, and women. As her classmate recalls Mary Daly, already employing her wry sense of humor, asked the Dominican professor, is the list of those with defective reasoning in descending or ascending order? Laughter ensued, and the students returned to their texts. Daly's 1954 final paper on the vocation of the lay theologian entitled Theology and Holiness reflects, however, the seriousness of her theological engagement. The paper explored the link between the spiritual, holiness, and the intellectual, theology, in the individual theologian. Inspired by the example of the angelic doctor, that's Thomas Aquinas, Mary Daly exhorts her readers to consider the enormous influence of individual theologians quite apart from the hierarchy. Her use of men here is indeed startling given her, her uh, future work. The activities of men whose minds are ordered to God then, whether they be theologians or those taught by them, will be more and more like the activity of the perfect peacemaker who is subsistent wisdom, that is God. That this can hardly fail to influence the real members of the mystical body and even potential members still remote from the church." End quote. One can hardly deny a certain ironic truth in her first attempt at a doctoral thesis. Mary Daly, the theologian, did indeed influence real members of the mystical body and even potential members by setting the church in an entirely new light, first in the church and the second sex, and then in her radical post Christian feminist critique. Some interviewees recollect, recollect, uh, recollected other kinds of disruptive moments in their studies. Sister Ch Therese Rose Lang, 1958 to 59, in discussing uh, how her theological studies at St. Mary's helped her prepare for the changes, suddenly recalled such an episode. I'll never forget in scripture, or maybe it was theology class, they were teaching us about Mary, and she's not this beautiful lady in white and blue. She was a regular woman, and she always got dirty. One of the sisters in class got so upset, she didn't know if she could take it. I think she almost walked out. But the priest tried to make us realize, you know, it is true. But see, some people have this idea of Mary that she's so pious and so holy, only in the white robe and her blue sash, she's not human. She continues, now including Jesus with Mary, they were human beings, and we've tried to put them on a pedestal and forget the human being. Another sister who preferred not to be named recalled an incident when she was coming out of class with Sister W and saying to her, how much faith have you got left? And she said, about this much. Because some of the stuff we were learning in scripture was so completely different. We were studying scripture as literature for the first time. Again, more about scripture. Some of the most memorable moments in the interviews was when sisters talked about being students. 
Sister Dorothy assured me that studying at St. Mary's was a very nice experience. We really worked very hard. We studied like everything. And the sisters that were there from the year before, they kind of helped us out. They would give us their notes that they had to study from. And I can still remember going out by the lagoon there and studying and questioning one another. She recalled going to the oral exams of the doctoral candidates, quote, just seeing the candidates sitting up there and the examiners and taking any question thrown at them. And you're forming these answers and kind of cheering them on in your mind. Hurry up and get this off but it was kind of breathtaking. I learned a lot from that. She compared that experience to what she observed, quote, when she was in Rome with all those priests going for their doctoral defenses. Mary Mikna told me of her own exam experience. We had the Summa, that was our text, and I remember I had an experience that I never had before nor since then. But I was preparing for my exam on grace. I dreamed, I studied in my sleep. The next day I woke up, my test, and took my test, and I got 100. Such stories provide some sense of these women's lively engagement with their studies and some understanding of the lasting effects. Some of the sisters volunteered other stories that illuminate a sense of camaraderie among women from disparate religious communities, which, by the way, was really still quite out of the ordinary in those days. Two sisters told me of exchanging habits with other sisters, trying them on and modeling them to their companions. Another recollected one time to, at that little river, we were studying. We sat there, we sat along there and pulled our habits up, took our stockings off and had our feet in the water and said, if our community could see us now. The charm of these stories is in the simplicity of these pleasures. It is perhaps sobering to consider that in the next decade, all of these women passed through and even flourished in a period of tumult that none of them could have anticipated. Finally, I want to note one other aspect of their experience of studying, the presence of Sister Madaleva Wolf. She is mentioned by almost all the women I interviewed. The sister who wished to remain anonymous was impressed by Madaleva's personal interest in the students' welfare, exemplified in making sure that sisters who needed typewriters could get them. F.T. remembered that Madaleva's room had French doors, which opened out into a small garden that she had planted. The poet's summer reading was, quote, some, about some kind of caterpillars that are very stupid. F.T. also recalled Madaliva's occasional poetry readings. Sister Mary Mikna had one of the most extensive recollections of Madaliva. quote, it wasn't like she was up there someplace and so, and we were down here. She was one of us. She would invite us in and show us all the different things she had in her office. She had a big Buddha and we were looking at that and she took it up and lifted it and there inside of the Buddha was a very small statue of Christ and she said, that's for the Chinese people who were worshiping Christ and not the Buddha. An outer course daily describes a falling out, and I'm quoting her, with Sister Madaliva, who had been turned off by my uppiness as a poor graduate student who wanted to reform her pet project, the doctoral program in theology. Daly had called for a pet professor to be removed. The paragraph concludes with Daly describing how after the falling out, Madaliva, and this is a quote from her, the poet prophet I had so admired so deeply withdrew her offer of a teaching job at St. Mary's, end quote. And I have to say, I sense a certain poignancies in Daly's recollection of this parting of the ways between her and Madaliva. Others described what Daly named in her remembrance of Madaliva, Madaliva's presence like a lent a poetic flourish and a sense of prophetic adventure to theological studies at St. Mary's. Alumnae at work. Sister Dorothy taught eighth grade for a number of years and then in 1962 received her library science degree from Rosary College. She served as assistant librarian at Alberno College until she applied and was hired as the librarian of St. Francis Seminary in Milwaukee. She believed that the combination of her library science degree and her theology degree helped get her get that position, although she also admitted that her brother was in the same class as the then retiring librarian, which was also helpful. Um, a few years later, she applied and got the job of librarian at the North American College in Rome, and that's where she saw those doctoral defenses. After four years, she returned to her community where she continued to use her combined skills in library science and theology. Mary Barbara Kane taught at St. Mary's for a while and then took up Bishop O'Hara's offer of a job to any lay graduate. Each year, and this was in the 1950s, O'Hara would name a book of the Bible to be studied in its diocese. 
When Kane arrived, she learned about that about 500 study clubs were preparing to discuss Genesis. O'Hara asked Kane to travel around the diocese to guide discussions in these groups, which were mostly women. So she got this little car and she would tootle around the diocese in Missouri and drive to these various small towns. And this is her now. So we would sit around with these ladies, and then at night, then it was a mixed group, men and women. And you know what? It was it just came out all of this theology and scripture, and this was not a common thing. And they would say, you know, why haven't we ever heard this before? I remember one lady say she hid the handout when she went home so her kids wouldn't see it. It had all this stuff in it, and I mean that's where they were, but I mean we could get off on these different theological definitions, end quote. Kane then, at O'Hara's request, moved to the CCD's main office in Washington, D.C., but eventually responded to a vocational desire to be a contemplative. When I interviewed her, as I already mentioned, she was in a Dominican monastery. Sister Frances Therese was a pioneer in the formation program, it's a quote, for the Sisters of St. Joseph Brentwood. She used skilabacks for Christology in the Jerusalem Bible. She talks about this transition in, in formation. It changed rapidly. The older sisters couldn't believe that these young ones were running around with these books or that they couldn't stay in the laundry longer because they had to get back to class. She talks about her work in the, in the novitiate and how another sister in her community commented to her, oh, I like you very much, but I have one thing against you. You made the young ones think too much. Among those novices who thought too much was Elizabeth Johnson, author of the groundbreaking She Who Is. In 1968, Daly put her livelihood on the line in publishing The Church and the Second Sex, and it appears that her colleagues' responses only reinforced for her what her research uncovered. So Daly's response to winning her tenure appeal was to delve more deeply into the church's exclusion and denigration of women. I want to be clear, I'm not saying that Daly's work would have unfolded differently if her colleagues had responded differently. I simply don't know. And in terms of its impact on others, I know many women whose theological studies have included sympathetic engagement with Daly's work. This is just uh, a news item here. Sister Therese Rose Lang worked with postulants for a year and then novices for six. She then did religious education in which she drew upon her scripture studies. Then in 1984 through 1995, she started a home to care for abused women and became a volunteer probation officer. And speaking of those whom she worked with, they usually come and tell me when they're doing well, and when they're not doing too well, they don't keep in touch. They're always afraid. I tell them, well, you failed, but come back. Everyone makes mistakes and falls. But you pick up the idea, then you can pick up and go on. That's important. So in the long run, all that helped me. My theology, my scriptures, all that background, especially the Gospels. I think the Gospels, you know, I try to live the Gospels. That's part of it. If you're not able to recall, Sister Lang is the interviewee who talked about Mary always getting dirty. Sister Pascalina Koff became novice director in her community and then served as prioress during the late 60s and 70s, a tumultuous time. She wanted to go to India with another sister and experience the Benedictine monasticism that was engaging with Hinduism. She was denied permission because Bede Griffith, a Benedictine in dialogue with Hinduism, was in trouble. Quote, so I made a copy of the letter and I sent it to Sister M and she called me up and I still remember she said, Pascalina, are we going to let men run our lives forever? And I said, no, of course not. She said, well, we have all kinds of other addresses of places we can go. Why don't we go over there and find out for ourselves? So she and Sister Anne did just that. They lived in Bede's Christian Ashram in India in 1976 and 77. She then came to a suburb of Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1978 to establish a Christian ashram, as I say, as someone who grew up in Oklahoma, where else would you put a Christian ashram? And she founded Osage Monastery, which opened in 1980. And in 2008, a Benedictine, the Benedictines sold the property to a Benedictine layman, and it still exists. Finally, I come to Sister Mary Mikna. She was the first woman director of religious education for the Northridge Diocese. And then after a year's study at Corpus Christi in England, she became the first woman to serve as the Northridge Diocesan Director of Religious Education and the first woman elected to the National Board of Diocesan Directors. When I interviewed her, she was doing scripture-based retreat work. When I asked her if her studies at St. Mary's had changed her viewpoint about her vocation, her place in the church, she told me, I think it was an opening up and a kind of freeing. When I finished in England, I knew there was a greater opening. It was freeing, a greater freeing. 
you weren't afraid. Years ago, you had to be. And even when we were studying at St. Mary's, Notre Dame, there were restrictions on what you could and what you couldn't read because the Vatican Council had not taken place yet. I find the same thing with people that I teach scripture to. Once they get a taste, they keep coming all the time. I think that's what happened to me. You get a taste of ice cream, you want it all the time. I agree. I think my religious life, my personal life, has been enriched very, very much because I have been able to pursue what I did pursue, and it began really at St. Mary's. As I looked over my life, it has been a continual growth in love for scripture and the desire to share it. As I said, I trace that back to its original fountain. It's a kind of a fountain that is sprawling forth in my life. Sister Mikna had told me that she was writing a book. So I went searching for the book recently. Its title, Scripture Stories, A Fountain of Prayer. And not only did I find it, but I came across these beautiful photos in her congregation's memorial of her life. Conclusion. What I have offered here is but a small sampling of the material contained in interviews with alumni of St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology. In rereading these interviews, I found myself thinking about Catherine Brakus's introduction to a collection of essays, uh, The Religious History of American Women Reimagining the Past. In rereading that essay, I found myself especially drawn to two statements. First, her point that, quote, both American religious history and women's histories are composed of hundreds of interlocking narratives, end quote. How very much do these interviews illustrate Brakus's insight in complex and various ways? The second is an exhortation. My hope is that historians will always ask themselves whether their research could be transformed or enriched if they ask questions about women's lives as well as men's. In some cases, the answer will be no. But in many cases, when the answer is yes, my hope is that historians will follow their evidence wherever it naturally leads, unquote. There is no doubt in this historian's mind that my research has been enriched in asking question about the women who studied theology in a small Midwestern women's college and getting some of them to help me answer those questions. St. Mary's Graduate School of Sacred Theology became a place, a room, if you will, designed by the poet prophet Madaliva. Together, these women, with Madaliva's help, they did the work of transforming Catholic theology and reconfiguring their own lives and the lives and the life of the church and the wider Catholic culture. There's a fair amount of backbone in these valiant women whose magnificence we are called to remember as Madaliva did those great women of faith from whom she took courage and found inspiration when she said yes to that strange impulse from, some, from somewhere outside of her will. And I, for one, am ever grateful for that yes. Thank you. I was struck when you were talking about their work afterwards by how um, few of them, except for Daly, went on to teach academic theology at the collegiate level. Did that just not happen at all, or uh, yeah. is it? I mean, I have some relatives from Mary, and I didn't have that much. And it was just how friends were able to call me for a while. Uh, Marianne's been taught for a while, but couldn't. She wasn't able to uh, keep up because of her own sort of theological. So there are some, but many of them went back and did uh, novitiate work. Sister Eleni Mallets, who taught here, she, so there are others as well, yeah. But I, I didn't, I actually wanted to feature some who weren't, who didn't do that, because I think that's also part of the interesting story. Yes. Would you like to say something uh, about the, uh, uh, impact of uh, St. Mary's College on Regina Mundi in Rome. Oh, yes, I that, can say a little bit about that. That's a yes. big step, I think. Yes. 
So for those who don't know, um, I think it's 1956. I know I'm a historian, but I'm terrible with dates. I always have to look them up. Um, Regina Munde was a school that permitted women to come and study in Rome. And my understanding from what I've read about it is that it, it was based, it was inspired by and based upon the School of Theology here at St. Mary's. And then when they, then there were, there were issues because the, the way that they weren't getting degrees that could be recognized here in the States. And so then Madaliva agreed that they could come here and, and then kind of take a couple of courses and get the, a degree here that would be recognized for them to teach. So that was, that was the relationship. And then I think Sister Mary Charles Borromeo went there at some point and, uh, and others. So yes, that was an inspiration directly of, of St. Mary. Yeah, I haven't seen that, so if I'd Ooh, love to yeah. see it. <laughs> if you find it, let me know. Anybody here find it, let me know, because I've looked for that, but I haven't seen it, so. <coughs> Other questions? Now, Susan. I just wondered about the connection between the sister formation movement and the Land O'Lakes Conference and how all of those, that movement, certainly for women religious in the 50s, and then the Land O'Lakes Conference in the way that it transformed Catholic education and specifically Catholic theological education, um, that those in some ways, where do they fit in with your history? Well, there, there isn't, I wouldn't necessarily, they're kind of like parallel and, oh, okay, so wait, let me back up and say this before, because it's been a while since I thought about that, but, so Sister Madaliva gave a lecture. Sister Madaliva's always giving lectures, and it was this, the education of Sister Lucy, and that really became, is seen as the kind of um, spark for the sister formation movement, and so, so here's how I would see these two connected. I mean, they're connected because of Sister Madaliva. And, and again, I would say, I mean, Gail, who's here somewhere, where's Gail? Has written a biography. I think there needs to be a lot more work. I would say it's a great biography. I highly recommend it. And there needs to be more work done on Madaliva. So she's kind of the, the common point between these two uh, events. And I would see, this is one of the ways I would see it with Madaliva. Madaliva had this great vision, as you can tell from that very brief quote I had about, you know, we're going to find another Catherine of Siena, and she's going to come out of the School of Theology. I mean, this is a fairly grand aspiration, right? <laughs> and, so, and so she had this sense of that women being educated was really critical, and that they were, and it was an intellectual kind of education. And so I see that as part of the connection. Now, she's not the only one, right? So there are other, other women who are also talking about this. Um, the other thing that I did not talk about here that also is important is Catholic action. And I finally have given up, and I, I've said I have a description of Catholic action that is like about a 10-word 10, 10 description. It's a movement. It's, a, it's an official kind of uh, actions. It's a justification. It's a mood. It's an inspiration. It's all these th I mean, it's everywhere and nowhere in some ways, right? But that also played a role in this context. And then if you go to Father Hesburgh, um, Edward Hannenberg just wrote a piece that's in Theological Studies, but he actually came to see me because I'm one of the few people that have read Father Hesburgh's dissertation, which is on Catholic action and the theology of Catholic action and baptism and confirmation being the sacraments of Catholic action. So at least in that sense, there's this real connection among these different movements, right? <laughs> so there's like, that's, that's how I would at least put it in the sort of landscape.
So in the middle 1960s, in Chicago, they would have the Summer School of Catholic Action, which I attended. Oh, in, wow. Yes, in, the, in 65 and 66. And I was encouraged by the Religious of the Sacred Heart, the nuns that I had in high school. And I think it's in part due to that. And listening to people like Charles Curran in 1966 right. <laughs> lecture about what it means to be holy after Vatican II, you know, that there were, there were ways that also lay young women, like myself, lay women, um, would see a possibility there was no... It was sort of not in my universe at all before that. So, so the I don't know what the connection is between Catholic Action and these summer schools of Catholic Action, which were like these week-long workshops for all these excited teenagers and right. high school and college students. But that was that was also a really exciting time. Yes, and and I I would just note that um, really one of my arguments about you know, as I've tried to figure out what's the story of this book, is that, so one of the, you know, there is that long quote I had in here about the woman saying, you know, Madaliva had a struggle. But at the same time, what, one of the things that's happening is that, that there's this movement called Catholic Action, and it's for lay people to become sort of spokespersons for Catholicism in the wider society, to restore the wider society to Christ. That, that was the, the movement. And, um, and there's a lot more I could say about it. And, and people kind of get hung up that it had to be, it was this official movement and had to have official sanctions. Well, yes, that's true, but I'm just telling you, read the literature out there. <laughs> it's everywhere. So, um, but then what they began to realize, in order for that to happen, lay like, people had to be educated in theology. And then in order for people to be educated in theology, then you needed to have more teachers of theology and that meant, and you had to have teachers of theology in women's colleges too, because that was an important place. And who taught in women's colleges? Well, right. And so that's part of the, the story here as well. Which, like I said, you know, this you all probably have other things to do and want to go to sleep or something. Like this. There's many other parts of this. Yeah, Gail. Uh, Sandy, about, uh, and I would never deny that the Holy Spirit would descend on Madaliva in the midst of a Catholic education conference and inspire her to offer St. Mary's as a place for the School of Sacred Theology. But I wanted to point out that back in the late 20s and the early 30s, when she was at uh, the Wasatch in Salt Lake City, where she was first dean and then yeah. president, mm -hmm. she had started a summer program right. for sisters heavy on scripture Heavy, yeah. heavy on Aquinas, and I kind of thought of that as the pilot program for the School of Sacred Theology. And I, I, again, in other places I've, I've written about that, but what I would say is what I find interesting in her autobiography, that's her appeal, because it was controversial. It's like Hildegard saying, the Holy Spirit is telling me to do this. Who are you to question me even though I'm a woman? Teresa of Avila saying, yeah, I mean, I don't know, this just happened, you know, I know this person, this happened to, what, you know, right? And it's not, but it's not then that they're not, that's why I said, to say that at the same time, she was strategic. She knew exactly what she was doing. Right. Although before, before she put the program together, she wrote to every, yes, every, Catholic yes. University to ask them uh, whether it was Georgetown or Notre Dame or yes. Uh, yes, to ask them if they would admit women and lay people into their graduate programs, they all refused. That's right. And that's when she thought, well, and it was, I think it was uh, O'Hara yes. who, who suggested, well, look, look around you, you've got the facilities, why don't you do it? True. And who's going to dispute the Holy Spirit? That's, that's the strategy. That's the strategy. 
Thank you so much. I'm so happy to, uh, to learn so much that's new and exciting to me. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the graduate school for the study of sacred theology and the college? Was it just housed here, or, or I just it, don't know? It was more, yes, just my understanding was more housed here. Now, someone like, so I, again, I can tell this story. So like Mary Barbara Kane, and, and obviously Mary Daly at one point was going to teach here. Mary Barbara Kane did teach. Now, the story Mary Barbara Kane told me, so, so when she, the Dominican sister, she said, so she was teaching theology, and Sister Madalia would bring guests in. And they would sit in the back of the classroom and watch her teach because this was like a novelty in a way, right? This lay woman teaching. So there was that kind of experience, but really the sisters were much, were pretty much, as I understand it, and there are people here who could correct me, look at you, Sister Mary Ellen, they were really pretty much separate, right? Yes. And a lot of it took place in the summer, and, and so there weren't that many undergraduates on campus, as I also that's okay. It's sometimes hard to piece this together when you're reading, but that so there wasn't much interaction. And in the in the regular academic year, it was a much smaller number of sisters. Most of the sisters came in the summer. Like if you read, and like I've gone through sisters, like I, so I've gone through sisters' academic records. So after about 18 years, they get their bachelor's degree because they're taking one or two courses over a summer. It's, there are remarkable stories there about that in itself, right? So that, that would be how I would describe it. Yeah. Does that help? <laughs> well, in following up on that, uh, did any of the graduates of the program come back to St. Mary's to teach? Yeah. And then if the what was the undergraduate religion theology level at St. Mary's during this time? Was it was it just catechism or was it uh, theology? My understanding is when it when it started, when the school started there wasn't and this would be very common, there weren't degrees. I don't know when it was, I'd have to go back and look, but sometime shortly after the school was founded, there was an undergraduate degree for students in theology here. But I I I'd have to go back and look at the dates. Thank you. So, um, so that was not that far, and that was really again, like I don't think Dave, um, I teach at UD University of Dayton, sorry, and they um, they didn't have a, a, a an undergraduate degree for a long time after that. The other thing, so Kathleen Going, who's also joined eventually joined a religious community, she taught here. She taught here in the summer. Um, Anne Condit taught here, and I think she did mostly languages, as I understand it. Um, Sister Mary Charles Borromeo, Mary Ellen Mockenburn, she taught here. Uh, Sister Maria Asunta Warner taught here. Elena Mallett's taught here. There's going to be, it's the seventh door syndrome, I don't know if you missed one or two, but those are some of the We applied for a, a grant from Lilly to have a conf whole summer conference on the school and to uh, bring people like Sandy back to study in that. The stocks went down that year and I had a mournful telephone call from them to say, we ain't got no more money to, to send you. But in preparation for trying to see what we could do with a conference, we interviewed some of the then living uh, graduates and this was the response we got. What did you learn? What, what did you go away with? And the conviction they had was they learned to read a text. And that while they didn't, the, 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 uh, the theology they t studied was by and large not Thomas Aquinas. It was a scholastic version, a, a later uh, version of Thomas that was taught in a very stilted kind of way and propositional way that Th Thomas didn't have. But I think that's very important that they, some of them recognize that when you can read a text, you can be a good student. And that was a conviction. Uh, I think of uh, Margaret Brennan was one of the people who told us. Just 
want to see, do we have any students who want to ask a question? Thanks. And this will be our last question. Uh, a, lot, a lot of pressure on me. Um, so you mentioned that Sister Madaliva retired in 1961, and then the school closed in 1966. So was it just her retirement that caused the school to close, or was it like Vatican II, or? Lots of different things were going on. And one of the biggest things which I did not mention, Notre Dame opened their graduate school to women. And so that sort of put an end to, because Notre Dame could, I mean, students could, I mean, they could go in the summer when students could go, but then they had a doctoral program, and then that really also, and other places as well. Could I just ask the point of fact that they, it wasn't just one of the women, and also men not pursuing coordination, right? That happened yes. at the same time. Yes, yeah, it was like people couldn't enter. So, yeah. But, I mean, that impacted so many times, like in these situations, a school that, a men's school starts to do things that wouldn't let them in, and then wouldn't want to go there because somehow it seems Sorry. I mean, it makes me sad, so I'm not sort of defending. I'm just saying that that was part of what happened as well. And then there were other places that were opening up, like Kevin, and there's so there were lots of other things. Yeah. So, although I still think Elizabeth Johnson didn't she have to sit outside? They were all sitting out in the Yeah. So, I would like to invite uh, you to join me in welcoming uh, Sandra Yoakum, or thanking Sandra Yoakum. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention that here tonight we have the founding director, Dr. Keith Egan, of the center. He's here. And we have three graduates of the Graduate School of Sacred Theology. We have Sister Mary Ellen Vaughn, CSC. Where's Sister Mary Ellen? Yay. <laughs> we have, um, and Sister Mary Ellen, Master's Class of 1966. We have Dr. Judith DeGrazia Harrington, Master's Class of 1969. And we have Mrs. Carol Law Allen, Master's Class of 1959, Doctorate Class 1961. Thank you all for being here tonight, and please join us for refreshments. Thank you.